Welcome to NetFront Presence. I'm Jeff Gordon of the Post-Dispatch. Jim Thomas, the beat writer for the Blues, back in the studio with us. JT, the uh, the beat just goes on, and uh, the Blues continue to rule the Central Division. So far, so good. Yeah, it, it has been amazing for me to watch, amazing for me to cover a team that wins most of the time. Uh, winning locker rooms are always uh, fun, uh, happy locker rooms. Despite your brief curse uh, a couple of weeks ago when you <laughs> wanted some adversity, and that led to, what, 12 goals allowed in two games. They've been, The Blues have been able to respond to the Jeff uh, Gordon uh, curse. But, boy, what a great Central Division race that's, that's shaping up. As good as the Blues have been, near historic, really, levels uh, uh, for a start here. And we're, we're two months in, they... They look behind them and right over their shoulders. Winnipeg and, and Nashville, just a, a, a few points, a few points back each. Yeah, if you look at the the way it's played out so far, past the first quarter into the second quarter, you know Winnipeg certainly legit. Uh, the Wild uh, got the, well, on the receiving end of that, but uh, nonetheless, and the Predators, of course, I think is gonna, that's a dangerous team. Uh, those are two good examples. Chicago's still young. The Wilds have had had three shutouts, and then they gave up some goals. But uh, the Blues haven't pulled away yet. They have established themselves that this team is going to be a postseason team, and now it's getting stronger. Having survived the first quarter shorthanded, Sammy Blake comes up. We'll talk about him in a minute. But uh, the big news of the week: Patrick Ber- Berglund back to active duty, shoring up what had been a suspect third line. Yeah, and. Uh... Right now, you've got Steen's been back, obviously, for more than a dozen games. Bo Meester back for three games, and now uh, Berglund uh, back against uh, Anaheim. This is, you know, barring a trade, this is the best lineup that you're going to have this season because, obviously, Fabry's out for the season. I guess it's possible Sanford might be back at some point in March, but at that point, especially if the team's perking along pretty good, do you? I mean, how effective would he be right. joining a team so late? So this is as good as it's going to get. Again, barring a barring a trade, and all of a sudden, the third line, maybe there's a little life there. Uh, uh, Berglund, who Jeff, he's a big dude. I I did not oh, yeah. realize seeing these guys. He he is a big Swede. And then, then Sammy Blay uh, got, got a little juice to him, and and uh, oh my gosh, Dmitry Yaskin with uh, a couple goals in his last uh, last three games. So uh, uh, that line did some good things. They they played good defense. They forechecked. But uh, again, we're, we're not saying it's going to be a Shen Schwartz Tarasenko line. But now they've got the possibility to, to to chip in with a goal every now and then. Mike Yo's plan initially for Patrick Berglund is, is to ease him in. And because he's back ahead of schedule, which was great news for a team that was fearing it might be more like Christmas before he comes back. Mm-hmm. So he's back in action uh, early on, uh, despite the problems with the second play, power play unit. Mike's going to hold him off of that for the time being, because he'd be out in front taking some abuse in that uh, in that role. He may do some penalty killing, and not a ton, but uh, some initially. So easing him in, just trying to get the better production five on five. I guess is the initial plan for Patrick Berglund. Yeah, yeah, and just missing so much time. Even, un, you know, Bo Meester missed <clears throat> all but three days of the preseason, but at least he had the offseason build up, the informal skates. Berglund had none of that, uh, a June injury, so it, it's going to take him probably t- 10 games, at least what Mike Yo said, maybe somewhere around there, maybe a few more or less, to really kind of get up to, 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 to full speed. So, yeah, it looks like the early plan is just to have him Maybe one shift each penalty on 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 the PK and and keep him out of the uh, the uh, power play for a while, but he'll be in there with that uh, third line. And you know, Jeff, explain to me again as the rookie here, kind of a Berglund in some corners of uh, Blues Nation, kind of a malign guy with the oh, yeah. Easter. Why, why is that? At tw- to me, twenty three goals is twenty three goals. But what what am I missing here? Well, fans have uh, he's been a whipping boy. And part of it is you look at, you know, the reality versus expectations. Early on, he was going to, he was one of the boy wonder guys way back when, the boy band days, as our, our old <laughs> colleague Bernie Miklos stuck the team with the boy band. This goes way back when Berglund was just a handsome youngster coming up uh, on, in the organization to the delight of many of the female fans and the chagrin of their uh, boyfriends, of those female fans. <laughs> so initially he comes in, and there were great expectations that he could really be something. Now, I think what's happened is Patrick sort of settled into a third-line role, and he's a real reliable defensively, very quiet player for the most part, just a good, good positional player. He bangs around more than fans give him credit for, and he tends to score when he does 
in bunches. You know, he'll go a long time without scoring, and then he'll score in a, a bunch of them. And so fans, I guess he doesn't meet what they thought he could be, and some fans have a hard time accepting that he's still an asset. Mm-hmm. Even in a role that where he you know he kills some penalties, he plays the third line, he checks pretty well, second power play, you know, ordinary work, but he's reliable within that mm-hmm. ordinary uh, mode. But I guess some fans just kept expecting more. Kept expecting more. It reminds me there a little bit of maybe a little bit, maybe not a, an exact comparison. Chris Long in football, number two right. overall pick, a pretty good player, but what you would expect out of a number two overall pick. No, and so some fans, even though he's gone on to do tremendous things off the field, uh, uh, you know, were, were critical of him his time here. So that, that's an interesting phenomenon. But but he's got to he's got to help as much as I enjoy the company of uh, at least uh, interviewing uh, Oscar Sundquist. It's it's got to be an upgrade. And Sundquist did a lot of things well and got better at it, but he just couldn't score. Right, just couldn't score. Now the other great corollary or the great uh, comparison with. Long and Berglund was, while Berglund didn't get crazy money like Long did, Mm -hmm. he got paid good money. And fans will, in hockey, everybody knows what players make. They study Mm -hmm. the cap. It's all there on the internets. And they, many people have felt for years that he's overpaid. Right. The fans sitting up in the stands. And which is going back to your long comparison, very reliable player appreciated by teammates more than fans. But then part of that is, you know, you get the coin, people again think there's got to be more. Yeah. But with Berglund, what he does bring, again, an upgrade over uh, over Oscar, who, God bless him, threw his body into the fray, is he does a lot of what Oscar did, but can I score the occasional goal at least. Yeah. And, and in, maybe in spurts, score in bunches. And, and we'll see what happens with that third line. But right now, as it's constituted now, obviously we know Berglund's a big body, Yaskin's a big body, and Sammy Blay is not small. So, and, and Sammy Blay, although he's not really what you would call a banger type, he's not averse, at least what we saw mainly in preseason, to throwing mm-hmm. his body around a little bit. So you got the potential for... Uh, Kind of a big physical line, but with, with with a little bit of skill, and and and, and I'm really uh, I'm really anxious to see what uh, what Blay can do if he's up for a while. Uh, you know, originally uh, Jeff Gordon, I thought maybe he was going to be a weekend rental like Wade Megan. That the Megan thing was at the tail end of the the Western Canada trip. A Sunquist had taken that uh, puck off the. Uh, uh, the foot, and they weren't really sure he was going, going to be able to play in Vancouver. So uh, the Chicago Wolves happened to be in the neighborhood, I guess kind of, Winnipeg, not exactly next door to Vancouver. So they brought him there for a day, but he was, Sunquist was okay, Megan was a healthy scratch, and then he was out the next day. I thought maybe this might be the case with Blake because you had no spare forwards and you're mm-hmm. playing a back-to-back. Hard to send a guy down after he scores a goal on right. a power play unit that had been struggling. Right. No, and that's something he can really add to that depth. We've talked about the Blues needing to find more punch. Uh, the first unit has uh, can certainly be better than it has been, but has a ton of talent. The second unit did not have as much talent. <laughs> was really the fall off. Now, if they could balance up the two units and you know get Pareko going, we've seen certainly seen signs of that overall on the offensive side. Add a guy like Blay who can certainly score and, and would be deadly on the power play given regular duty, could play with anybody on the power play. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, you know, that does change your scenario. And I think you know, getting back to <laughs> your improvements, what was Sun, Sun, Sun Kavist was good defensively because hmm. they put a lot of responsibility on centers uh, in the defensive zone. You know, you're like a third D man. You've mm-hmm. got to have a guy that wants to do that. Berglund, like the most of the Blues D men, has the long levers. The long, the long arms. You know, he covers a lot of ground, and from that standpoint, back checking, he'll be good. And the bonus there is the one problem with Sammy was being out of position in the defensive zone. He's used to looking for the breakout. He's used to be think he's thinking offense. How can we counter? Well, first things first, as he keeps hearing from Coach Yo, <laughs> got to your teammates have to believe you're going to be where you're supposed to be. Yeah, when you to cover and then also to get the puck out. You know, when you get the puck, you got to con- quickly convert from D to O to offense, and you got to know where you are. You don't want to leave the D man holding the puck, and then, uh oh, uh-huh. <laughs> where do I go with it? Yeah, and and then even uh, st- speaking strictly of like offense, there, like Shen and Schwartz, almost from the beginning, it's almost like they had radar. They knew where each other was mm-hmm. were going to be almost at all times, and you just didn't get that sense with Blay. So here's a. Here's a real good opportunity, and I had heard that Yo wanted to kind of settle into the roster at least as much as possible, that the next call-up, he wanted a guy that would stay up Mm -hmm. the whole season or for a while. This is a great chance 
for Sammy Blay to do just that. And, you know, we'll see how it uh, pans out. But I'm interested to see not only that third line, but also the two power play units. It's it's interesting to see what the makeup is now. And it wasn't something that that you'll really advertise in the wild game. Basically, you have the first line Mm -hmm. with Dunn and Petro. That's your first power play unit. And then you have the uh, the second line with Pareko and Sammy Blay. So maybe having those two lines kind of intact and, right. and together, maybe that'll help the power play chemistry. Because for the life of me, Jeff, I couldn't uh, I couldn't fully fathom how can uh, Shen Schwartz and Tarasenko be so good as a line, but yet when they get on the power play, it's like they never played with each other before. <laughs> a lot of it was, you know, they're trying to move them around, have them attack from different places, and at times they lack the chemistry. I think a lot of the fans that I identified, and I did too, really, Steen hasn't been very effective on that first power play unit. I thought the group was better when Stastny was Stastny. playing, and then, you know, Schwartz was more of the oh. Steen type. In the, in the configuration. Well, now you have Stastny still in, in what he does well. Steen back on the second unit. Uh, you have, uh, you know, going with your, your a guy like Blaze is a skilled guy. You know, Pareko uh, is emerging again offensively from where he was earlier. They're getting him to think quicker, react, you know, get the puck through the layers of, uh, of the, and especially in the power play where you have more clean, clean looks. Assert yourself. So, yeah, I do like the second unit. I like Steen off of that first unit. And, hey, uh, shout out to Vince Dunn. Just yeah. keeps going. He keeps yeah. Carl Gunnarsson on the on the bench <laughs> up in the press box game after game. And, and that is a huge deal because his skill set uh, is unique, and he's able to defend well enough to put that offensive skill skill set to work. And it, it, it's been interesting to see how Yo has, as the season's progressed, more and more confidence mm-hmm. in in Dunn. First, he was uh, at first he was on the second power play unit. Now he's on the first unit, and we've seen in games where the Blues have fallen behind, he'll put Dunn on the regular defensive pairing with Petro just to have because that that group, the Petro pairing, is going to be going to see more ice time just to get more offensive uh, oomph on there. So here we have the two really kind of glaring weaknesses I thought uh, of this tremendous start for the Blues. Special teams and the third line. Now let's let's see what happens. Maybe we've got a little bit of an answer here. Although we still don't know about the PK. The PK gave up two power play goals goals against Minnesota. Although I guess in theory, having Berglund once he's back right. there, that that should help as well, right? Yeah, you're hoping that he gets back to having that regular role because he's a smart, good positional player. And again, with his ranginess. He's able to take away some passing lanes and a sense of anticipation. Again, a better player than people realize. A lot of what he does, he does quietly by being in the right place versus flying around. The player, fans like players that fly around. He, he tends to be in the right place. So you get him up to speed and you get Bo Meester up to speed uh, as a PK on your PK. And again, he's another big guy, positionally sound, not flashy, but is where he's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Theoretically, that's two key guys. Seems like he's got the long arms, the long stick, sure. and not knock away a lot of a lot of pucks as well. Now, cap wise, this this knocks you down a little bit. I'm far from an expert on the the NHL uh, salary cap at this point, but uh, Berglund's three point eight million. Now it counts on the books, and right. you're down to I think it's only about a million and a half. There's not much room. No, you don't have a lot of you, you don't have a lot of spare change unless you you you, you do something else. There were some. Some some thought, some speculation that maybe Gunnarsson would would be the guy to go. That Prosser was more than happy, uh, although he'd obviously he'd rather be playing. But in his role as a once every twenty four game type of guy, and that Gunnarsson, what I I think about two point nine million. I, I could be off on that. That that you could free up more. But you know, Gunnarsson had been playing pretty well. I know I know plus minus isn't the end all be all stat, but. Plus 10 is, is plus 10. When you look around the league, and now it segues nicely into the next topic, you look around the league, you see everybody's looking for help up front. And there are some guys being offered on the blue line. The Wild needed help. They were able to wait out the Prosser situation. I think Nate will, will likely fill their need. But a guy like Carl Gunnison right now is in a market that's flooded with teams trying to, to move D for a, for a winger. Now, a great example of that is in Pittsburgh where former Blue Ian Cole has uh, been, sat out three games, uh, I think may have, and maybe could be sitting out some more, while they tried to orchestrate a sign-and-trade deal 
see if somebody would take Ian Cole and give him a, his next contract so that it would be not just a rental play, it would be a, a solid play for a franchise looking for a guy that could play in the top four because Cole's a pretty good D-man for them. Pittsburgh's so desperate for offense, they're willing to move a guy that was, by all accounts, one of their, a real reliable guy for them on the blue line, and yet we still haven't seen that deal happen. So sometimes the market you say, well, just trade Gunnarsson for a forward. Well, it's, it's not yeah, fair, it's not it? right because a lot yeah. of teams are looking, and the prices for on forwards are high. The the supply is is bad, and a lot of teams are <laughs> going after the same element. Yeah, yeah. Who would have thought? Now uh, we're uh, between the one quarter point and the one third point of the season that the of all the uh, forward line pairings and the defensive pairings that the only one that would be. In all 24 games so far, and 25 with Anaheim, would be Dunn and Bortuzzo. One that Dunn would make such an impact. And uh, uh, again, uh, uh, just today, just Wednesday, Mike Yo mentioned that uh, an out-of-town writer, that uh, he was asked, any players on the roster surprise you? And he mentioned, of course, Shen. But Dunn was the other surprise, that, that he's not only stayed with the roster but gotten better, but also... Uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't this really the first time Bortuzzo has gotten extended right. play? That's the only pairing they've been. They've been in every game. Those two together. Yeah, no. Uh, Bortuzzo's a guy that he came up. He was he was going to give you the physical element, and you thought that's great. But he, early on, it, it appeared that he had a lot of limitations. Traded for Ian Cole. We just talked about him, who became a very good player for the Penguins. Helped them win a couple of cups. A lot of fans were, were sour about that exchange because. Cole's a guy that never quite fulfilled his potential of a first-round pick, uh, a good two-way guy, good two-way prospect coming through the U.S. developmental program, and a lot of he just never really got over the hump. And and I think he, with Hitchcock, that that's it's not unique that that happens. He just didn't get over the hump with Hitch. They bring in Bortuzzo. He all right, tough guy, gets in some scraps, hits some people. That's it. Well, I mean, what you're seeing now in this system where they encourage aggression. Mm -hmm. Well, he's comfortable going in. He doesn't mind forechecking. Mm -hmm. And if they ever got to a situation where they're going to play 7-D and roll one up on a wing, it would be him because he, he loves going in there, banging yeah. into people. He's not not a great offensive player, but he's but he's comfortable in there. Yeah, He doesn't panic when he gets in. He's very calm when he gets in there. A lot of D-men, they just – there's like an alarm goes off when they get inside the dots because, oh, my God, I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> what am I supposed to be? Sort of like a dog jumping doing? through that uh, that uh, electronic fence. Yeah. You know, is there a jolt that hits him when they get between the <laughs> – past the dots? Like, ah! <laughs> but, no, he's 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 just so calm out there. And as you say, he – he now, he's not going to drop the gloves as much as Thor Thorburn, but he gives you that – he's he's maybe the – if you had to pick who's, who's the next guy in the right. lineup of mm -hmm. t toughness, uh, it would be – uh, Bartuzzo. He didn't play, I didn't think, particularly well against uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Predators. And I thought, well, gee, may, is, would, would the coach make a switch already and put Gunnarsson in there? But he stuck with him, and I thought Bartuzzo seemed like he was back on his game against the uh, the Wild. So mm -hmm. he, he really likes what he sees from that pairing. But as Jeff Gordon would say, how does history remember the Nate Prosser era? Yeah, you know, he just couldn't get in because guys kept playing well. And I think we, Yo, again, today, I guess, expressed his affinity for the guy. They well, go, go back to Houston. That's one of Houston. his boys. I mean, yeah. he, he goes way back with him. And, and I I think we mentioned on one of my very first uh, 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 net front presence with you guys how it showed me something with Yo. A lot of coaches will, will play their pet rocks or their toys just because they know them. But mm -hmm. He didn't. He knew that he had better guys. So as much as he, 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 Prosser was a proven commodity, how much he trusted him and everything, he played better guys. That showed me a little bit with Yo. And here's a guy, Prosser, he moved down. I remember doing a story on him in camp, how he just had all his clothes. He was basically living out of his car. He's got three daughters. There were Barbie dolls stro strewn all over his car. And uh, actually, I, I just talked to him, even not for an interview, just talked to him just a few days ago. And he said they had just moved his – once he made the regular season roster, his wife and the three daughters came down from uh, from Minnesota. And uh, they, they the team had just moved them into a bigger place to live because the place they had mm -hmm. been living like a condo was kind of small with the three girls. And I think they spent much of Thanksgiving weekend moving in there. Wow. Well, uh, oh, boy. Such yeah. is life in the NHL. Such is life in professional sports. Now – 
even at uh, at a minimum type salary, he, he's well compensated for those twenty four games. But it's still tough. Yeah, but a guy yeah. always had a smile on his face and could have maybe been a distraction about not playing. But uh, he handled it very well, and uh, you know I, I hope he ends up somewhere. And it, it could very well we could very well see him uh, in Minnesota playing for the Wild <laughs> Saturday night. This, this is a wacky game. This is the wacky well, sport I know, of hockey. This is now the one thing important. Nate's been caught up in it, but otherwise. It was interesting what you said earlier about Mike Yo looking for some stability with the roster, wanting to have the group. And, you know, while down in Dallas, uh, Hitchcock is tinkering with the group, moving guys around, the guys are up and down, uh, the goaltender's in and out. I mean, it's been – he's been testing the patience of the guys trying to get the game where he wants it. Yo has really moved the other way. He's tried to keep guys together. Uh, he's, tried to, he's tried to go for stability. As you mentioned, he hasn't been juggling the D. You know, once Gunnarsson was the odd man out, he remained the odd man out, unfortunately mm-hmm. for him. And with Nate, same way. Um, he, he, he tried and tried and tried to get Yashkin over the hump, and it finally has paid off. So it seems like he has really stressed, uh, as to the best of his ability on an injury plague team, stability. Yeah. Yeah, stability, and once seems like once you earn his trust, I mean, it, it's 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 not necessarily fleeting. Now, I still get the sense from him if he, if he doesn't think you belong on this <laughs> roster, boom, yeah, uh, take the last train to Clarksville or the first train or whatever to 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 wherever. But uh, uh, yeah, it's been an interesting dynamic, and also just you know, kind of, and, and I want to kind of keep an eye on this. Maybe write about it at some point. His his faith in Jake Allen. I just wonder, and, and you know better than I. Uh, the uh, five goals against the Islanders and then the six goals in Calgary to start that Western swing. Obviously, there was a seventh goal empty net. And would would Ken Hitchcock have? have oh yeah, Jake yeah, <laughs> yeah. He would have yanked him, and they had a, that was a problem. You know, mm-hmm. Hitch uh, Brodeur. Much of what Brodeur's job was when he came down from the front office to work with uh, Allen was to throw the his body in between Jake and the coaching staff. <laughs> You know, they, it was, uh, and because Jake, it got to him. And it, everybody, just like back in the day, Mike Keenan got to Curtis Joseph. You know, Mike Keenan wasn't for everybody. You know, Grant Fuhr could handle him because Grant Fuhr just didn't give a hoot about much. He just was a chill guy and he just mm-hmm. could handle anything. Mm-hmm. And he was perfect for Mike. But boy, some guys are tough on goaltenders. And, and Hitch was. And I think, again, Mike might be, you may argue at times, overcompensating, but. I think the players don't mind having a guy that has is that you supportive. Don't always, you know, there's an accountability factor with Mike Yo. Don't right. get me wrong; there is. You have to he be accountable. Yeah, he, huh? He can get mad. Oh yeah, and uh, but you don't have to, yeah, but you don't have to be looking over your yeah. shoulders. You know, uh, no. And you laugh. At, I had a flashback to uh, after the Cal- the very Calgary oh. game where if I had a raw egg and put oh. it on that uh, he was not that hairless head of his, it oh. would have you you would have had a fried oh. egg there very. Very quick, and again, it was as much as kind of his body language than oh. than 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 what he said. And I actually, my impression, I think Allen's probably playing a little better than his stats. The Blues have had some games like Toronto comes to mind, even the uh, the Edmund the second the Edmonton game here, even the Minnesota game where they've had big leads in the third quarter, and I think the. The forwards, maybe yeah. even the D men, are like hunting goals. They're like, "Oh boy, this is I'm I'm going to get a goal." And they they've gotten a little sloppy at the end, and teams have gotten a couple goals late that have deflated Allen's goals against. And I, I always want to say nationally, but I guess more North American wise, when I read some of the big picture from the the guys that cover the whole league, there's still a little doubt. It seems about what well, is Allen really the guy that you you're going to trust in the playoffs? But I again, I think he's played better than his stats, and his stats aren't bad. They're just not great. Yeah, you know, I think uh, it was a big step last year getting a getting the uh, the reboot under Marty, admitting which was amazing that he admitted. Now nah, the stuff got into his head. It wasn't he's fine physically. He just needed to have a reset. Emo- you know, just mentally. And I think that will still be held against him to a degree, the fact he admitted that he needed to kind of step back for a minute and get him, gather himself. But the season finishes well. He steals a playoff round. And the second round doesn't play as well, but certainly not his fault the team didn't advance. But he certainly stole one round for sure. And then he gets into this season, and the Mike Yo approach is to just back him, period. You know, Hutton's going to play once in a while, and – and, you know, Jake, Jake's going to fight through things. And he's going to, you know, they're going to monitor him. They're going to work with him. They're going to stick. But it's time to grow. And for a guy, again, every level, he it's not been immediate. But junior hockey, uh, American Hockey League, now the NHL, he's he's taking those steps. And 
I think this coaching staff is is well suited for him, and it's not just the fact they brought in a guy that he's spent summers working with, mm-hmm. uh, but just I think it's got to come from the head coach, as you point out. It's like with a quarterback, right? Right. The quarterback doesn't really think the staff is, you know, like Mike Mart screaming at uh, his quarterback. How many young quarterbacks just died? Joe Germain. You know, right on, there. On, it was a nationally just, televised preseason just game. He just withering he just, Mike Mart. He was just, executed on live TV yeah, at halftime. Yeah. At halftime, yeah. It just, and, you know, a little tough on, a little, little, yeah. Mike, a little tough on quarterbacks. Well, some coaches are tough on, on, on goaltenders. And, and Mike, you know, he had success with, uh, you know, with the Dubnik's turnaround in, in Minnesota. And so we'll see if this, this holds up well. Yeah, yeah. Jeff, big, big month of December now upon us. Only 11 games in November, only four road games, but now 16 games. Oof. Like in December, every other game, seven games on the road, uh, lots of division games. You get another crack at the, uh, at the Predators. Uh, Winnipeg, you get them in an interesting back-to-back where the Blues play them at home, and then the very next night they start that West Coast trip with, mm. uh, with Winnipeg. And also, if that weren't enough, those pesky uh, Tampa Bay Lightning who've been jockeying back and forth for the top spot overall in the league with the Blues, they come to town. By the start of the new year, after December, we'll be exactly 41 games halfway through the regular season. We're going to know a lot about this team. We, I think we, we have an idea they're going to be pretty good. But we're going to know a lot more as this month plays out, won't we? Yeah, this, this homestand's a good build-up to it because you're, you, if Sammy Blake can play, you start building him up, well, now the tough tests come. If you can get Berglund going, well, now the tough tests come. You get Bo Meester in, settled, well, now the tougher schedule comes. You know, in a week where you had a, a, a chance to catch your breath and a chance to practice, uh, those are two things they're not going to have many opportunities to do yeah. <laughs> come December. Every other day yeah, they'll be playing. Right. No, no, no real practice time, optional skates, and then no real, very little catch your breath time. So this is their chance. This is why I think Mike wants to have his team together. Because now it gets real, and he wants everybody who's here to be good to go. Because again, he's gonna ha- he's gonna have to move some guys in and out of the lineup to a degree because of just injuries and fatigue. Mm-hmm. But he needs to have he doesn't want no done experimenting. He yeah. needs to have guys I, he I believes get the, in. I get the feeling we're not going to see uh, any more of the uh, well. Let's put Bo Bennett in with uh, Shannon yeah, Schwartz. We're yeah, probably not going to no, see that. No, for a it's just and that's why it was very important for you know getting back to uh, our guy Yashka and a familiar topic on net front presence uh just so long he wasn't getting anything done and they kept kept giving him a chance kept giving him a chance then they took him out and gave him more chance uh, any sense from the group that i mean you can see why they stick with him because there's potential mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but boy i tell you this is as you talk about the month to come if he could be the kid that looked like a potential 15 to 20 goal scorer now if he could become that guy right now with the challenge ahead, yeah, boy, what a difference that would yeah, make. Yeah, and he—he's at least it looks like, in theory, there's a potential for him to be on a line with more skill around him, with Berglund, and mm-hmm. if, if Sammy Blay is who who we think, because you mentioned about uh, uh, Yo, how he and he will pound home a point to these players about Blay, how you, your your teammates have to trust you, they have to know where you're at at the ice, you can't forget about your defensive responsibilities. If he's mentioned it to us once since the start of camp, he's mentioned it a half dozen times. How much he wants to tell you, asking? Net front presence. Crash the net. You're a big body. Mm-hmm. You need to be up there. If he's told that to us a half dozen times, how many times do you think he's told that to Dmitry Yaskin? <laughs> Probably more than a half dozen right, times. Right, and he's gotten himself there. He's got himself you well, know, knocked the, the, the around the post. Well, the last goal, and, he, was, yeah. he was right there. Yeah, yeah. Jeff, answer me this. I know we're probably running out of time, but. Are the Nashville Predators, are they in the Blues' head a little bit? They come into that game. It was a little bit of a buildup because of the playoff last year and the, 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 had, had, had not played many Central Division teams. But is Nashville leaving the building saying, yeah, we know you're off to basically a record-setting start, but, hey, you still can't beat us? Well, Nashville, interesting team. Of course, you go all the way and take a run at the Cup. They make a great trade to bring in Kyle Turris to really give them that one more piece that they needed. Uh, they get a guy like Benino, if he, when he's healthy, gives them that third center. They, they woke up Ryan Johansson, who had a terrible first 15 games. Uh, Forsberg, Arvidsson, these guys caught fire last year. And that team, that line was on fire at the end of last year. It was like the, the Schwartz line this year with Tarasenko and Chen. Johansson, Arvidsson, and Forsberg got to that level last year. You know, they muddled through the first uh, few weeks of the season. That Some of the top guys struggled. 
But, you know, but again, Rene's played a million games against the Blues. That decor is outstanding, even with Ryan Ellis out. Uh, they're just an outstanding group. They have fortified themselves up front. They've got their, their, their legs now, and they also have the history. As you point out, you know, when you do it in the postseason, uh, you take out a team and you keep going and you play for the prize. They're, that's a very confident group over there, and they fought through a little bit of that early season malaise, and they're back now. And that's that's for real. I mean, you talk about going all the way through this season now with these two. Though I think those two teams. Now Winnipeg's a bit of a wild card because a lot of talent, but they haven't proven it. Nashville's proven it, right? And now, and then they've gotten better, and they'll get stronger as they get healthier. And I think it's going to be fabulous. And bonus for Jim Thomas, trips to Nashville. Not oh, yeah. the worst. Oh, Not yeah. the worst. Yeah, yeah. Never get being in their preseason game. With my wife, she made the trip. Grant Wistrom was in one of these little uh-huh. country bars on Broadway with great singers in these small <laughs> clubs. I asked the waitress, what's he drinking? Sent him a drink. Then he sees me as I'm going to the bathroom. Jim, you're not going to write about this, are you? I said, Grant, I'm off duty unless you burn down the place. Yeah. That's your secret then. Wistrom arrested for arson otherwise. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then he asked, Jim, why aren't there places like this in St. Louis? Right. Yeah, an yeah it's him. special. Special place. So that's Jim Thomas. I'm Jeff Gordon. This has been Netfront Presence. I think we can uh, wrap up this top these topics for this week. The team uh, fortified, feeling frisky, heading into a very challenging December, as you, as you set the table. So there will be much more to talk about going forward. Uh, we will ask you to uh, subscribe to this podcast. We're getting more subscribers. It's available on sdltoday.com slash podcast. If you happened upon us on Twitter or Facebook, then you know where to find us in the future. Uh, Google Play, Apple. You can find us with the the iTunes, so look out for us, find us, recommend us to your friends, but subscribe to us so that you'll know that we're coming. We'll come right at you, and we'll talk, uh, oh, we're coming to YouTube. Gary Harrelson tells us that we're going to be on YouTube as well. And someday we need a surveillance camera in here to catch our banter. Especially this time of year, Jeff, you don't want to always listen to Christmas carols in the car. No. Pop us in, man. Maybe, uh, maybe for the music bed uh, going forward in December, uh, Gary could put some Christmas music in. Maybe you could intro us with some <laughs> yeah. bells. Well, we we appreciate all your support and good comments we've heard from folks in our live chats on Friday. So check that out as well. For Jim Thomas, I'm Jeff Gordon. Until next time, again, this is Net Front Presence.